top of the morning to you. This will be a little bit of a technical challenge. I'm going to be using both hands, a mouse in one and a mouse in another. So I want to thank Bob and Cheryl and all the people involved with this meeting. It's great to be back here in Calgary again for the third time. And I do feel that I am linked to Canada uh, in terms of my relationship with prostate cancer because it was 25 years ago, almost to the day, that a patient of mine uh, in Culver City showed me a clipping that Dr. Labrie in Quebec was looking for American collaborators to work on some new drugs, some clinical studies of new drugs involved in the treatment of prostate cancer. Those were novel agents. One was an antiandrogen. It was called Uplex. I was very, very excited about it because the label was in French. It's really exciting. The other one was a drug called an LHRH agonist, which blocks LH pituitary, which lowers testosterone. And it was called DTRIP6. That was the chemical abbreviation. And it only took 17 years for our FDA to approve that drug. And it finally was approved not long ago, and it's called Trellstar. So those were two novel agents that I started to use in collaboration with uh, Dr. Labrie back in 1983. Now, interestingly, what happened was that there was only a handful of us American docs who were doing this. So my practice, which was general oncology, slowly became a prostate cancer practice. I basically was inundated with men with prostate cancer looking for new treatments. So sometime in the uh, mid-80s, I decided that I would focus on prostate cancer. And by the late 80s, my entire practice was prostate cancer. So I've really had a 25-year frontline experience with prostate cancer. And it also pointed out to me that when you focus on one illness, with a great deal of intensity and passion, you learn so much more about it that it makes me really quite concerned about my general medical oncology colleagues who are trying to cover the waterfront of all these different kinds of cancers. This is the uh, Ashland Creek, a matter of a few minutes from our house. Uh, it's not snowing right now, it's probably in the mid-80s. I thought if the weather was hot here, which it's obviously not, that I would cool you off with this slide. Those of you who have been to Ashland know that it is uh, well known for its Shakespearean festivals. So when I thought about this talk, I actually uh, wanted to bring some of Shakespeare's thoughts to this, and I, I actually asked myself, why am I giving this talk? What's the purpose? You know, I think speakers should ask that question. What do I want to accomplish? Well, when my feeling is when we look at a book and go through a, a, a book or read a play or, or a poem, what we're looking for are take-home lessons about life, how we should conduct our life, what is meaningful to us, how how can we change any of our passage through life with what we've read? So, great books, great plays, great poems, you know, Shakespeare, a little bit of Shakespeare. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as doth the night the day that thou canst not be false to any man. And things like John Donne, 400 years ago, no man is an island unto himself. Each man is part of the continent, a clod of the main. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. These are the take-home lessons, or kinds of the take-home lessons, that I want to share with you as it relates to prostate cancer. So, we come from Ashland to Calgary. And uh, I was talking with these two guys <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> And one suggested uh, that it's important to have a DRE to the other guy. <laughs> and that's my wife, 
Miwa, who is somewhere here, <laughs> over there. So let's get into this. Uh, this is not, this is, I'm the straight guy, I'm, I'm the intro to Dr. Goldenberg, who's going to be the jokester. I'm going to give you some hard stuff that may be upsetting to some of you. So if you have a hard time with politics and some heavy duty philosophy, maybe you should go to the bar right now. <laughs> anyway, Houston and Calgary and the rest of the world. And by the way, my practice is now international consulting. I have patients from all over the world. The only exceptions are Antarctica, and I have no patients from Africa. But every other continent I have patients from. And I would tell you that we have a problem throughout the world in terms of the way men are managed with prostate cancer. I'm not going to bother with my own computer. I'm just going to look at what you're looking at. So Houston, we have a problem. We have not only a health care crisis, we also have a health crisis. So this is a, a, a very significant problem. Because what I've seen in my lifetime is that the spirit and philosophy of medicine has changed from that of a medical business to the business of medicine. And that's not good. And what's really not good is most of us have led very good lives. We have our children and our grandchildren. We have future generations. They will suffer with what's going on right now and what will come if we do not act together to change this. And right now, what you're seeing is just the tip of the iceberg. Very much like climate change, we're just beginning to see the effects of what's going on. So this is a real problem. So I would preached to you early this morning that we must be involved. Like Gandhi said, you are the change you wish to see in the world. And like King said, our lives begin to end the day that we become silent about things that matter. So if you watch the debates between Hillary and Barack, and now the debates between McCain and Obama, you'll see that a lot of this energy is focused on universal health care. But what about the quality of the existing health care? Do you know that in the United States, the third leading cause of death is the health care system? So does it make a lot of sense that if the third leading cause of death is the health care system, that we want to now have universal health care? <laughs> that might be a good answer to population control. So I'm very, very distraught about these uh, political issues. And while I was up here uh, having some fun prior to coming to Calgary, we were in Toronto, up in Collingwood. I woke up in the middle of the night and I actually, I couldn't sleep and I wrote a six page letter to Obama. Now my mission is, how do I get that to Obama? Obama, my Gene Dixon prediction, will be the next president of the United States. I think that I, I think I can sense what the uh, the populace of the U.S. how they feel, and I think Obama will be the next president. So I need to figure out a way to get that letter to him, and see whether or not there's any kind of resonance regarding his wish to really truly find answers rather than just talk about issues at a very superficial level. So we need to now start to focus on issues that relate to bringing back science uh, and art into medicine. Uh, we need to do this in a fashion that uh, involves physicians working together in a collegial fashion, in a collaborative fashion. We need to change this balance uh, where physician income is now outweighing patient outcome. That scale should be tipped heavily towards patient outcome. And it's not for many uh, patients. And this is a general a generalization. There are definitely dedicated physicians out there that truly care about their patients and don't sleep all at night worrying about their patients. But there are plenty of others who don't feel that way. So what does this lead into, and how does this lead into the talk about 
concepts in medicine. Well, one of the important things for you all to realize is that you are all U-boats. Not U-boats, but U-boats. You're unique biologic organisms. No one has your fingerprints, no one has your DNA or your retinal pattern. You are not only biologically unique, you're psychologically unique, and you're spiritually unique. We physicians have to return to taking the pulse of the patient. We have to start talking to the patient again. You know what's really strange and bizarre is how often all that I see with the patients that consult with me are data, pieces of data that relate to what tests were run or what biopsies were done or what radiologic evaluations were done, but not the history is missing, the conversation with the patient. And as medical students at the University of Chicago, we were taught that 95% of the diagnosis is in the talking to the patient. They will always tell you the story. We need a new approach to medicine that is result-based and not fee-based. Can you imagine that? We need to look at medicine in a true military fashion, as a campaign, as a way to defeat the common enemy. So if you look at, at uh, great generals in our lifetime, like Patton, and you understand that he was victorious because of his focus on strategy. Even the word strategy comes from the Greek, from the office of the general, strategia, from the office of the general. So if you look at the issues that relate to a military campaign, the metaphor between a military campaign and defeating prostate cancer are quite striking. But how often do we see these concepts involved in the care of the everyday patient with prostate cancer? How often do we look at the issues of prevention or understanding biological principles? What happened to the medical record? And this, the importance of, of uh, the electronic medical record. We're in the year 2008 and medical records still are far from anything that are scientific. The early recognition of prostate cancer, the risk assessment of the patient, probably one of the biggest flaws in my seeing patients is the lack of the proper risk assessment, which we'll get into. The pros and cons of treatment options, the basic principles underlying tumor growth, stopping supply lines to the tumor in terms of anti-angiogenesis and dietary changes, key areas of conflict like, the, like bone integrity, vascular integrity, renal integrity, supportive care of the patient, and also issues that relate to the psychology of the patient, the will to live, and end of life services. So now we get into the, the real essence of this talk, concepts and philosophy. I have a hard time separating philosophy from concepts. Philosophy for me connotes a sense of things that relate to feeling and heart. Uh, concepts are a little bit more uh, just ideas, cognition, brain thoughts. So here's a bit of philosophy, Abraham Lincoln's religion. When I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. That's my religion. It's a beautiful uh, bit of philosophy. And another, another piece that I like that uh, I have in my office from, uh, from Sir Francis Peabody, in his address to the Harvard Medical Students in 1917. The secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. So now we're in a situation with, with your lives where you're now faced with a crisis, prostate cancer. And our job, working with you, is to figure out a way to supplement this crisis and turn it into opportunity. And we can do that if we understand the concepts. If we understand the concepts that are part and parcel of good prostate cancer medicine. So what I did was I came up with an acronym for concept. Concatenate, not a typical word that we all use, but I'll define that for you make into a whole by joining a system of parts, 
concatenate our notions. And notions are not just superficial thoughts in the true sense of the word. These are ideas which exist in the mind as a product of careful mental activity. So bring together these, these important thoughts to create enlightenment and to provide tactic. This is the importance of the principle of concept in not only prostate cancer, but in all of medicine and in all of life. How do we bring these thoughts together and really understand things, enlighten ourselves, and create tactic? Tactic that leads to, to smart strategy. How do we do that? So this is a concept within a concept, the genealogy of healthcare. I love family history. I think it's I think history is so important to this to this world that we don't make the same mistakes that, uh, that those that before us have made. So here's my genealogy of healthcare. Prevention, begat diagnosis, diagnosis begat evaluation, treatment, supportive care, and end of life services. So I'm gonna use this genealogy of healthcare all throughout the rest of this talk to focus on concepts in the context of prevention, diagnosis, evaluation, treatment, supportive care, and end of life services. Uh, so this should make it easy for you to see where we are with these different concepts. And my goal, my desire is for all of you to start to look at this with your own individual care, and the care of those in your family and friends, in your support groups, and then try to figure out ways to invoke these principles, these concepts, into the care of the everyday patient, be it a patient with prostate cancer, or breast cancer, or lung cancer, or any illness. So as a prelude into the issue of, of uh, prevention, and all these other uh, areas involving concepts, I want to share with you just the environment, the milieu, in which these concepts must uh, work. And one is the issue of uh, different general philosophical issues. And one of the key ones is teamwork. If we really need to focus and, and, and really uh, encourage the teamwork between the patient and the physician and the partner. Call it the three Ps or PQ or whatever. But this is a very special relationship, especially in medical oncology. I mean, what other profession or job in the world gives you this incredible intimacy, this immediate intimacy of a relationship as the cancer doctor has with his patient and their family. I mean, for me, it's striking. You know, back at the University of Chicago, my first year in medical school, I really hated medicine. It was all memorization. It wasn't until we started seeing patients that I truly loved it. And it wasn't until I was assigned a preceptor, one of the faculty, who introduced me to different concepts. And my preceptor, I was very lucky. My preceptor's name was Elizabeth Ross, who you all know as Kubler-Ross. So I was fortunate to have Kubler-Ross as my preceptor, my mentor. And th this issue of intimacy of the patient and the, and the uh, physician and the partner is so intense, so sincere, so sweet. There's nothing like it. We spend so much of our life developing intimacy, but in the real, in the real world of real medicine, with real doctors, you have this immediate intimacy into the lives of another person who's in the midst of a crisis that you can alter, and in doing so, have a, get a tremendous high in doing so. And that's what I would love to encourage in terms of your relationship with your doctor and vice versa. And we have to include the family. A lot of you protect your family by not involving them. You don't want to disturb or upset your children or your siblings. You need to include the family because this is a learning process for them to understand what you're going through and what they can learn from this to, to then share with their family and friends, their children. The other bit of general philosophy here is the patient is the customer. And the customer is always right. The customer, the patient, the client is the prime directive the one who gets served. So the prime directive here is patient outcome. And physician income is okay, but it should always be secondary to patient outcome. Another bit of general philosophy is the issue of empowerment. 
When we, were, when we guys were kids, we learned from our dad about cars. We got that sense of empowerment that when we brought our car later in life to the gas station, we weren't buffaloed by the, the guy there, the mechanic, saying that we needed something. And some of you have heard my little story about when I was returning from a ski trip to the University of Chicago, driving my 19, whatever it was, 84 Pontiac Tempest four-cylinder car, and it was sputtering out just before I got to Omaha. And the local gas station guy said, we'll give you 50 bucks for junk, but your engine's gone. <coughs> but I was empowered. I had worked at my dad's gas station. I understood about cars. And I thought about this. Why would this car all of a sudden just be dying on me? And I managed to get the car into Omaha. My, my classmates and I checked into this really sleazy motel, which I think was a house of ill repute. <laughs> we went across the uh, street to the local theater. And we didn't see a movie, but we bought popcorn for dinner. That was our dinner. We left a, a, a little letter underneath the Pontiac dealer's uh, door with the keys. Who did that nowadays? With the keys saying, my car isn't working. Please take a look at it. We need to get back to school. And the next day, went in for the diagnosis and was told, here's your bill. It's $1.98. One of your ignition wires came off the spark plug. <laughs> but thank God I had been empowered by working in my dad's gas station. <coughs> so it is important that you, in the midst of, of a health crisis, of a health issue, have that same sense of empowerment by learning. So self-reliance and accountability, important concepts in our world today. Uh, realizing that, that you, the patient, have the most to gain and the most to lose. Realize this incredible power of the medical record, which we're not utilizing as physicians and which I've actually done some stuff with my own patients that really has made this a powerful tool, even with something as simple as Microsoft Word. And as a Mac Macintosh user, I'll tell you, it's very painful for me to use the word Microsoft. <laughs> <coughs> the concept of biology as something that has to be viewed over time has tremendous power, which I'll touch on. And to organize our medical records in a to-do fashion to where we actually resolve problems, not perpetuate them. There's enough, there are enough people in the world who are not feeling well, who are ill, that we don't need to perpetuate on this. Because we're getting to the point in time where the population of the world is so big that if we don't resolve illness, we're going to have a complete catastrophe on our hands. So we have to start thinking in a more visionary fashion. The definition of empowerment, uh, my co-author uh, of our book, A Primer on Prostate Cancer, I've always liked Donna Pagliano's definition that she came up with. Taking responsibility for and authority over one's own outcomes based on education and knowledge of the consequences and contingencies involved in one's own decisions. And this focus provides an uplifting energy that can sustain in the face of crisis. I think this is a real phenomenon. Uh, when you know something and are able to help yourself with it, it's a very powerful tool. And there are some wonderful things on the internet that you have access to. You have PubMed, and if you just Google PubMed, you'll get that URL. You have a wonderful software tool called Quosa, which usually sells for $250, but the people that uh, are selling it made it available to, to any of my patients and to anyone with prostate cancer who was aware of the offer for $25. Uh, Quosa uses a, a PubMed interface and downloads papers and identifies full text papers for free that normally uh, most uh, uh, publishing companies would charge anywhere from $35 to $55. Use Google and Google Scholar. And then when you get this information as a PDF or if you want to print it out, share it with your support groups. And do what I'm trying to do in, in my little bit of spare time create what I think is really missing in today's world, the concept of a Manhattan Project mentality. You know, if we can harness the atom in a number of years by bringing people together with a Manhattan Project focused mentality, we can do that with some of the medical literature that's out there that a lot of physicians don't have the time to look at and really channel it into something productive. I would assure you that there are worlds of new treatments that have already been out there and published that are not being used because 
there is really a lack of time for individual physicians involved in patient care to look at that literature and bring it together and organize that, those, those papers into something meaningful. Again, it gets into the issue of resolution, coming up with a, an answer to a problem. Uh, I'll give you one example of, of that. Uh, years ago, uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, a, 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 the group there came up with a treatment of, of cancer using photodynamic therapy, using light therapy, where they would inject a chemical substance into the blood, and it would be localized in tumor cells, and then all you'd have to do would be to direct a certain light of a certain wavelength, and it would destroy those tumor cells. That approach was called TOCAD, or TOCAD. And uh, that actually, eventually, it was used in a clinical trial uh, in Canada, in Toronto. That was a few years ago. And it was used in men with prostate cancer who had recurrence after radiation therapy. I believe the results were quite promising, but nothing really has happened with that. It's sitting there. And like I mentioned earlier with the, uh, with the Trellstar, for a drug that's used and has been shown to be efficacious, it takes 17 years to get approval and access. That's not right. So your speaker today was one of the two oncologists who actually filed a lawsuit against the FDA for early access of drugs that have been shown to have efficacy but yet not have gone through all the clinical trials that take so many years for patients who have had treatment who are not responding. So Jay Freireich from MD Anderson, who was a pioneer in the treatment of combination therapy of leukemia, and who I knew from my days down in Texas, and myself were the only two physicians that were willing to join the Abigail Alliance for early access to cancer therapies. So this can be done, but it needs, it really needs unity among the population to, to get the answers that we, that we are looking for. So let's go into now this full, full course genealogy of healthcare and how concepts involve these different uh, crossroads. So in prevention, here are some concepts that we really should be utilizing. We can be utilizing right now, not in the future. We can utilize history that you have. All of you guys with prostate cancer uh, may be passing on, if you are genetically inclined, the tendency towards prostate cancer to your sons, and if you have brothers, to your brothers. And if you have daughters, you will pass on an increased risk of breast cancer to them because the two diseases are linked very closely. If you have prostate cancer, there's a higher risk of breast cancer in your offspring. If you have breast cancer, there's a higher link of prostate cancer in your family. That's in the literature. So we need to utilize the history, the genetics of it, uh, the experience of others in terms of prevention. So you should be sharing your history with all your family members. And one good example is something that uh, I just heard about and now and which just recently got a lot of uh, attention, and that is the 5-alpha reductase drugs like Proscar and Avidar in the prevention of prostate cancer. That stuff was published uh, on ProStar five years ago. And the physicians throughout the United States, Canada, and the rest of the world were very reluctant to use ProStar to prevent prostate cancer, despite a 25% reduction, reduction in the incidence of prostate cancer, with a seven-year follow-up. The concern was that the use of ProStar would cause an increased risk of higher grade prostate cancer, higher Gleason score prostate cancer. That's been, now, been blown away and shown to be not true. How many more years will it take before we start to see patients who have a family history, a strong family history of prostate cancer, who are put on Proscar or Avidar, which looks like an even better drug? Avidar having preliminary data showing a 50% reduction in the incidence of prostate cancer. But have you seen that on the news? I haven't. And I haven't seen one patient in all those that I consult with so far in my lifetime that has come to me saying, I came with a family history of prostate cancer. My father had it, his brothers had it, one of my brothers has it, and I was put on Proscar or Avidar to prevent it. I've yet to see one patient like that in my lifetime. That doesn't make any sense to me. So here we have a concept of prevention, and we now have pharmaceutical agent at least Proscar, and it looks like 
again, Avadar will be better, that should be used in the context of prevention. We have all these other uh, areas in prevention that involve men at greater risk, exposure to cadmium, Agent Orange, airline pilots. Uh, these men should be looked at with more carefully that surveillance should be uh, turned up, intensified. And we should be looking at the existing medical literature regarding risk factors, especially in the context of, of men who are at higher risk for prostate cancer. What could be utilized in those men to prevent it? So in your sons and even in your daughters, why not get them involved in a nutritional program that involves things like selenium and boron and strawberries, which you had this morning, but not enough of them. <laughs> like a man, to lower the, either the incidence or the aggressiveness of prostate cancer. Why, why do we always have to wait until we have a, a, a four alarm fire before we do anything? We should be doing this more in a preventative mode. So again, in the same prevention uh, uh, portion of, of our genealogy of prostate cancer, we have to learn from history. If man does not learn from history, he's doomed to repeat it. Or as Churchill said, what we have learned about what man learns from history is that man learns nothing from history. I think I like Churchill's quote better than Santiago's. So I like the idea of this concept of active surveillance, so which I have re-termed proactive integrative management, PIM. So proactive integrative management should become a concept that we're utilizing not only to help mankind, but also to reduce all the, the uh, horrific healthcare costs that are associated with a late diagnosis. So I, we're having computer problems. Uh, I, I, I can't uh, get to the uh, form that I wanted to show you, but basically it's a Word document that, that really outlines what different, uh, different tests that should be done from physical examination to family history to PSA to DRE to lipid profiles that are, that are highly advanced and way beyond what we're currently using, to essential fatty acid uh, testing, and it just has those listed with the dates next to them. A very simple form. It's a checklist, you know? Gee, it's uh, 10,000 miles, my car needs to be tuned up. I need an oil change, which I should do every four to 5,000 miles. I need to look at the uh, tires every so often. I need to check the spark plugs and so forth. What's the big deal to do this with our health? And in doing so, we need to always remember that everything in life, all of biology, is integrated. Nothing really uh, sits alone. It's the integrative wheel of, of, of biology. And this is really important in the, in the setting of prostate cancer. Because it's, as you've heard, more men die with prostate cancer than from it. So why don't we use that history of more men dying with prostate cancer and figure out, okay, if they're dying with it, maybe we're not addressing the other issues that are the with it issues, the cardiovascular, the kidney issues, the, the neurologic issues. Uh, we have to start thinking about all the things that integrate with prostate health. We have to look at this issue of screening, which I think Canada has been really a major leader of. <coughs> and again, I have to give tremendous credit to Fernand Labrie in terms of uh, the, the importance of PSA screening. Do you know that there are HMOs in the United States that say you don't want to get a, a PSA? Because if you get a PSA, you're going to be diagnosed with prostate cancer. And if you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, you're going to be operated on, and if you're operated on, you're going to be incontinent and impotent and maybe have an operative mortality. So they throw, they mix in all different uh, thoughts that really are illogical in the sense of not every man with prostate cancer has to be channeled into some type of invasive therapy. But what about the concept that if you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, it's a reflection that something is wrong, something needs to be looked at in terms of your overall health. That the integrative wheel really uh, is, is not really aligned properly. And this whole issue of getting screening tests when we're in our 50s or 60s is really ridiculous. 
Prostate cancer doesn't start when you're in your 60s or 50s. It starts when you're in your 30s. I've had patients 35, 37. If you have a family history of prostate cancer, don't start screening at the age of 50, as the American Cancer Society has said for so long. Don't start screening at the age of 40. Get a baseline. In fact, what we should be doing with our children is when they're at their peak of health, which is supposed to be around the age 25, we should be establishing, and we should have done this for ourselves, our baseline to know what our normal is when we're at our peak. What was our bone density when we were 25? What were our lipids when we were 25? What was our body mass index when we were 25? And every so many years, we look at that baseline to see whether or not we are deviating from that peak, that optimum of health, to what we need to correct it. <coughs> so this was the document that I can make available to Bob, and you can have it on the CPN. CPCN website. Again, it's very simple. So let's move into the next uh, crossroad, diagnosis, and look at concepts that are important there. And these are the three concepts, validation, quality, and skill. And by the way, this talk today is a very new talk for me. So it's not like I've had years to really hone this and add to this. So these are beginning thoughts. These are just new reflections. And there may be a lot more things to add to them validation, quality, and skill issues that you might want to contribute and think about or add to or mention them this morning during the, during the question and answer period. So validation, and by the way, these concepts apply not just to medicine, they, they apply to everything in life. And if George W. would have looked at some of these concepts, my, my country wouldn't be in the total mess that it's in today, as you'll see. I told you this is political. <laughs> so validation, always validate critical biologic inputs. The Gleason score is a key ingredient in all the nomograms and neural nets, and I'll go over what those mean, nomograms and neural nets. So what does that mean to validate it? Well, it means that you really need to, to look for those talented physicians that know how to look at the pathology of, of prostate cancer. Before I went into oncology, I was a hematopathologist. My expertise was in lymphomas, and specifically Hodgkin's disease. I was highly published in that area. I worked with the very famous pathologist, Henry Rappaport, who actually came up with the Rappaport classification of lymphomas. And I was astounded in his consultation service of all the missed diagnoses of lymphoma of Hodgkin's disease, or the overdiagnosis. In fact, in my first year in practice in Beverly Hills, I uh, joined an older doctor. And my practice was associated right there with where all the celebrities go to, Cedar sinai Medical Center. The young girl with Hodgkin's disease who had had radiation to her entire upper chest, her mediastinum. But my policy was to review all of the lymphoma slides because of my expertise. I looked at his slides. She didn't have Hodgkin's disease. She had a benign disorder called reactive hyperplasia. Totally benign. And I had to tell her and her family and notify the pathologist at the hospital that they had made a wrong diagnosis. Validation. If you're not an expert in something that's an important crossroad in a person's life, that's going to mean a huge difference between how you treat them or if you treat them, then you have to have some way to, to know that you're at a very high level of expertise in making that important diagnosis. And if you have to, you have the tissue from your biopsy or from your radical. It's put into wax, paraffin wax, and it's called a tissue block. So every biopsy is put, every biopsy, is, those cores are put into paraffin wax, and from that tissue block, slides are cut and stained, put under a microscope, and read. But you have tissue blocks. <coughs> at the hospital where you had the biopsy, you were at the laboratory. <clears throat> you can get those tissue blocks and send them out for an expert review. Because a change in the Gleason score, the GS, alters, detected. And I believe strongly, whether I'm an ex-pathologist or a current pathologist, that local pathologists who are reading prostate cancer, they should have to go through some form of accreditation, that they have at least a batting average 
of at least 75 or 80 percent in terms of correct diagnosis. At least that, if not higher. And I'll tell you, prostate cancer is a lot simpler to look at under a microscope than lymphomas. So some of the, the experts, the, the, the chefs in, in the pathology of prostate cancer, are people like Helmut Bonkoff in Berlin, John Epstein at Johns Hopkins, Dave Bostwick, uh, who has his own laboratory, Larry True, Scott Lucia, and there are others that need to be identified uh, who have shown expertise. But I think we should have some accreditation for not just prostate cancer, breast cancer. When I was doing general oncology and I had a breast cancer patient, there were certain pathologists that I knew that I could really rely on, and that's where the slides were sent, where the blocks were sent, for them to review it. In a world of difference. Quality. If you just look at something as simple as the technical equipment, this is important because things that help to identify prostate cancer and help in the, in the, uh, the, the actual physical diagnosis of prostate cancer through biopsy are highly variable. For example, the transrectal ultrasound machine, uh, the variability in that equipment is significant and the number of megahertz, the, the units of, in terms of megahertz, be it 7.5 or less, can make a difference between what you're seeing. It's like wearing a prescription, putting on glasses, that's the wrong prescription and everything is blurry. MRI. What's really amazing to me is that I'm working with the Dutch radiologists, they've been using 3.0 heavier Tesla magnets than we've been using, and the, the detail is so much better with the 3.0. There are only a few centers in the U.S., I don't know about Canada, that are using 3.0 Tesla, that's the 3.0 T. Most of us are still using 1.5. But to go from 1.5 in the United States to 3.0 is an FDA-required clinical investigation. So if I want to go from a Duracell AA battery to a Duracell C battery, do I need a clinical trial for that? I don't think so. This is really mindless bureaucracy. And that's probably a redundancy. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, tomorrow I'll be talking about bone density. And I'm really, really very upset about this because I think this is an expression of patient uh, outcome being subordinated to physician income. The DEXA scan is called the gold standard. And maybe it's rightfully called the gold standard because it brings some gold to the physician. Because the DEXA scan is in the physician's office. But in the context of a man with prostate cancer, or any man who's in his 50s or beyond, a DEXA scan is very misleading because it reads osteoarthritis, degenerative joint disease, and vascular calcification, all things that occur commonly from the 50s on as bone density. So it gives you a false impression that your bone density is better than it is. So instead of a DEXA scan, there should be use of the QCT, quantitative uh, computerized uh, tomography bone density scanning, which is much more accurate uh, and which is not affected by vascular calcification or not affected by osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease. But it's, that's done out of an outpatient facility or out of a hospital. And it is more expensive, but not much more expensive. But I'll go into more detail in that and other issues of uh, male osteoporosis, which is an epidemic problem in the world, tomorrow. So quality also, believe it or not, relates to specific laboratories doing testing of blood and urine and other specimens. I found that, for example, the, the vitamin D metabolite, the 25 hydroxy D3 levels, are most accurate when you use a special uh, methodology called LCMSMS, it's liquid chrom chromatography mass spectrometry. And the lab that does that is Quest. So I don't want to send out my 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels. And by the way, 25 hydroxy vitamin D is an important substance that slows down the proliferation of prostate cancer, among other things. So I want to know that if I'm testing, I'm testing with accuracy. And then the issue of skill. I'm always astounded when I see a patient and do a DRE, and it is entirely different than the DRE interpretation uh, from another doctor or doctors. Or when a patient tells me, God, that was, 
much the, the theory that you did was quite different than the in and out burger approach that uh, was done by the doctor before you. I mean, give the guy's rectal sphincter a chance to adjust to your finger. We're not using a plunger. We're, you, we're doing a sensitive examination of very sensitive tissue. Take your time when you're going and doing that DRE to assess how big the gland is and, and, and feeling it anatomically from the base to the mid gland to the apex, from the right side to the left side, and documenting your findings with some type of an objectified format in the chart that there's information there. How big was that gland? And were there any irregularities? And where specifically were they? And also there's skill involved in, believe it or not, reading various imaging studies. Major differences in what I've seen in terms of how one radiologist reads an ultrasound or a CAT scan or an MRI. Uh, I have experience with uh, uh, a PET CT study on a patient in Florida where I had suggested a new kind of PET CT using fluoride 18 to pick up bone metastases. And he was assured by his local doctor that the local facility in Florida could do it. But it found out that the local facility did not only the F18 PET CT, but at the same time, on the same day, they did what's called the fluoroxy, uh, fluorodeoxyglucose, or FDG PET CT. Because they could bill for one of them, but couldn't bill for the other. Well, when I challenged the radiologist and said, you can't use these isotopes together, they'll interfere with one another, he said, oh, I didn't know that. He said, I'll call the patient back and we'll do them separately. That's astounding. And that's how your interacting and networking can disclose these kind of bizarre behaviors. But we really have to understand that there's quality in terms of, of, of imaging studies, how they're read. And perhaps we need to be looking at that in terms of, again, accreditation. And this whole issue of objectified reporting, most of the things that we see in radiology reporting is narrative. It's not objectified. We're not looking at a man's bone scan and saying that there are index lesions that need to be followed in the right sixth rib anteriorly and in the left femur. We're making these narrative remarks from one study to the next, never looking at index lesions and saying, index lesion one in the right femur on January 1st, 2004, now shows dramatic improvement and is no longer visible. That's the concept that I want to see in terms of being able to evaluate efficacy of therapy and the status of the patient. And of course, there should be measurements. And to be able to do this, there needs to be side-by-side -side comparisons. And as one patient from Europe said in a presentation at a medical meeting in Amsterdam, I don't want doctors, this is a patient addressing physicians, I don't want you doctors to be giving us weasel reports, which he really, which really translated in, in North America to cover your ass reports. Well, it could be this, but I can't rule out that. There may be a, nothing here, but again, it may be cancer. I mean, we shouldn't tolerate that kind of weasel report. We should have the physician realize that he is a physician, a human being. And there should be, if necessary, a waiver that says, I am giving you this report with the best of my ability, but it's not actually, you know, something that I can tell you that's the word of God, that's 100% always going to be accurate. It's to the best of my ability. So we need to have that rather than the radiologist covering their, their butt with saying it could be serious or could not be serious. Because it doesn't help the patient or the, or the physician team come up with a meaningful change in strategy. Okay, so, how am I doing with time? You're good. I'm good? <laughs> so, I was going to stop the questions over here. Uh, but I can continue on, or I can stop the questions and then go on. For, I think I've got another 20 minutes. Would you rather get up and ask some questions? Ryan, <coughs> Ryan will you put the floor mic out, please? <coughs> No? Do you want to start your questions or do you want to continue with Dr. Stone's presentation? Continue. 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 Okay. Okay, so we'll move on to the results. Frustrated of evaluation.
baseline. I mentioned that earlier. Prior, but this also relates to prior to initiating a new therapy. Come up with the important variables that are going to tell you whether or not your therapy is working or not. And to do that, you need a new baseline, a, a resetting of looking at what's going on right now. So here's another concept besides baseline, and that's biologic endpoints. What are the biologic endpoints that we're going to be using in your case? Will it be a bone scan? Will it be the PSA? Will it be another biomarker? Will it be your bone density? In the evaluation, history is so critical. And history in this context relates to this, the use of history of thousands and thousands of men with prostate cancer who've come before you, where we've now been able to use their findings to tell you how well you're going to do with the treatment, or how, whether or not you have a certain uh, spread of disease to a certain location. These are, these are uh, basically uh, approaches that use history to forecast what will most likely be their probabilities. It's part of risk assessment, but it's also part of being able to tell an individual patient that with your Gleason score and your PSA and your clinical stage and other factors, that your chance of having a great response at five years or seven years to surgery or radiation will be X percent. Or like a patient on the internet uh, yesterday wrote in with her husband who had a Gleason score of nine and a PSA that was in the teens, who had had seed implantation, and his PSA now was rising rapidly. If there would have been that kind of use of the neural nets and algorithms and nomograms, it would have been very clear that this man's risk assessment at baseline, prior to any treatment, would have indicated that he would have had a very substantial risk of disease outside the prostate and in the lymph nodes. And it would be no surprise that a local therapy like seed implantation would not be effective. So we should be using the history of thousands, actually now probably tens of thousands of men with the various uh, nomograms and neural nets that are out there. You've heard of, you've heard of and know of some of these. The Parton tables is one of them. After Parton's, Parton's paper came out in the early 90s, I went to a conference of urologists. And in the conference, the room was much smaller than this. It was a workshop. And the, the doc, a very excellent urologist, uh, Mark Soloway from the University of Miami, would present a patient with Gleason score, clinical stage, and the usual stuff. And he would go around the room and he would say, Jack, what would you do with this patient? Uh, Bill, what would you do? And uh, he's 45 years old, he's got a Gleason score of 7, and he's got a PSA of 15, and his digital rectal doesn't reveal anything, his T1C. What would you do? And one guy would say, he's young, operate. I agree, he's young, operate. And there was no real objectification of data. And here I am, I'm the only medical oncologist there. And I'm sitting with the Parton tables. And I said, well, according to Parton and his associates, with his Gleason score and his PSA, he's got only a 35% chance of organ confined disease. I don't think I want to operate on this guy. I want to really look further and see where is that non-organ confined disease? What's going on? Where is it? Is it outside the capsule? Is it in the seminal vesicles? Is it in the lymph nodes? Because if it's outside the prostate gland per se, but not in the lymph nodes, then I want to offer him radiation therapy. Because the field of radiation is going to be more, it's going to embrace a, a larger area. If it involves lymph nodes, I may want to put him on androgen deprivation therapy. And then maybe later on consolidate him locally with radiation. And the next patient was presented, and we went around the room again. And no one ever asked me at the end of that meeting, what was I looking at? What are these part of tables? No one ever was curious enough to even say, what are you clicking at, Steve? And uh, all through the years that followed, I kept looking at the different nomograms, the different neural nets, which use more advanced technology. In fact, if you go to, go to prostatecalculator.org, you'll see some magnificent tools that are free to anyone, where you can plug in data and, and see what your risk is for having prostate cancer confined to the prostate or more likely to be outside the prostate, or more likely to be involving lymph nodes. How nice to use the history of others who've come before us to better, to better treat 
yourself or your brother or your 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 friend in the prostate cancer support uh, group. And if you go to uh, the website from the Prostate Cancer Research Institute, and if you look under uh, software, you'll see something called Prostate Cancer Tools or PC Tools 2 and 1. When I was in practice, we spent over 100 grand to have the, the software programs, a whole suite of them created for anyone, free of charge, <coughs> for all aspects throughout the entire course of the patient, from diagnosis to issues of whether you have prostate cancer or not, to how you should be treated. So utilize those tools. So I mentioned already the skill regarding things like DRE. Uh, I also mentioned, uh, to some extent, uh, using the laboratory test. But for example, if we look at PSA, we have all these PSA derivatives, like doubling time and velocity, nadir PSA, PSA density. These are all these free tools. They're not expensive. They all are derivatives. If you've got the PSA in a gland volume, you just divide one by the other, and that's your PSA density. If you're on a treatment, and the lowest level of the PSA is the nadir PSA, you have all these tools that are correlated with whether or not the treatment is successful or whether the patient's at risk. So we should be using those PSA derivatives. And this whole thing about objectifying results is important. So side-by-side -side readings, tables. I mean, this is 2008. Surely we can use a computer to create a table or a graph to show what a reading is over time. The context of the patient, the environment in which you're seeing the patient is so important. Context, you know, coming together, weaving together. So the patient's context is the patient's biology, their patient's psychology, their philosophy, their financial situation. They're all part of the treatment decision equation. So when I saw a patient in practice down in the LA area who had come from a major Southern California University, who was 80 years old with a PSA of 85, and thought that he was living in the year 1885, I was pretty amazed when he had undergone a radical prostatectomy. It's a true story. And when his PSA after the radical came back 45 or whatever it was, still very high, he underwent radiation therapy. But it would be clear to anyone using common sense or nomograms that this man already had systemic disease at diagnosis. But even beyond that, uh, this man was truly, totally out of it. Uh, he also was physically abusing his wife and beating her up. I mean, so what do we do? We channeled him into a radical prostatectomy into radiation therapy. We have to look at context. Again, look at the nomograms and the artificial neural nets before channeling a patient into local treatment. The same thing in terms of a diagnosis of prostate cancer. You know, again, the Canadians have led the way. Uh, Larry uh, Klotz, uh, I think, has done a, a tremendous job in leading the way to this issue of using a PSA derivative, like PSA doubling time, to help determine whether a man newly diagnosed with prostate cancer should be treated with active surveillance as opposed to an invasive procedure. And this should have been something that we had invoked years ago. Thank God it's finally being paid attention to. But this is very, very important. That's a, that's a good example of conceptual medicine, principled medicine. Uh, let me see if I can go back to that. Well, that other example there was the context of the patient having radiation therapy or surgery. The, concept, the contextual uh, issue is does that patient have LUTs, lower urinary tract symptoms? Does he have to urinate frequently? Does he get a lot of, uh, up at night a lot to urinate? If he does, that patient would be better suited, suited to having a radical prostatectomy. Because now you're going to get rid of that element of, that's affecting his quality of life, that urinary difficulty, by making a whole new urethra for him, by removing the prostate. So he'll now be urinating like a young man and you will not be making his life miserable by giving him radiation therapy in that context where either therapy could be effective. So looking at that patient's symptomatology is so important 
in terms of saying, hey Jack, you know, you could have either a radical or radiation, but because you're having urinary problems, and because we know that radiation is going to make them worse, let's solve two problems with one treatment. Let's kill two birds with one stone. And this is the most important concept to me. Status begets strategy. You have to know what the status of the patient is before you can present to them a meaningful strategy. Use every available tool to understand the patient's status. Do we have a problem? And what is our problem or problems? So status begets strategy is the most important concept that's violated in biological systems in the world today. For example, in cancer medicine, we almost always underestimate the extent and the amount of cancer that's present. And we don't, when we don't optimize the status evaluation, this so-called risk assessment, what do we do? We subject the patient to unnecessary therapy. And sometimes, like the man with Alzheimer's disease, we do this repetitively at huge cost to the healthcare system. So if you can't cure a systemic disease locally with surgery, don't try to do it again with radiation. Or don't try to do it again if radiation fails with cryosurgery, if the disease is not confined to the prostate. This is discussed in, in, in uh, some detail in a previous talk I gave here, I think it was 2004, but also on the PCRI website in an old uh, issue, an older issue of the Insights, which is on the website, from July 2002, called Strategy of Success in the Treatment of Prostate Cancer. So I already touched on this, all men and women are not born equally, that's, that's a myth. And what do you call a medical student who graduates first in this class? Doctor. What do you call a medical student that graduates last in this class? Doctor. So we have to look for the, the, I know that it's not always easy to do this because there are just so many doctors and so many patients, but I think if we strive to understanding that there are differences in skill level, that maybe we do things that involve accreditation. Maybe we do things that involve to bring up other physicians to a higher level of skill. And there are certain uh, therapies that do involve major skill levels, like radical prostatectomy, like seed implantation, like cryosurgery, and even radiologic procedures, like prostacent, which I don't use anymore, but Convivix, which is only available in Holland, to pick up lymph node uh, metastases, and pathology of prostate cancer. And how do you find an artist? How do you find a, a good restaurant, a good, a good movie? You network, you talk, you collaborate, you communicate, you use history. Biologic endpoints to, to assess therapeutic efficacy. You know, I'm supposed to be in a, a scientific profession, but how can we possibly be scientists, be, be physicians, if we don't use biologic endpoints? They provide objectification as to whether or not what we're trying to achieve is accomplished. And they should be graphed over time to show trends, which are so important. Is there global warming? What is the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere? And what has it been in the past? And what is it doing now? And is it getting worse or better? All of these laboratory findings that are used in today's medicine should be graphed to show trends. And one of the most important uh, graphical bits of information is PSA. So doing a, a natural log of PSA slope provides you tremendous amounts of information. I mean, this is real simple. To use that kind of biologic, to use that kind of an endpoint, PSA, and show the slope. And I'll look at the biologic endpoint to achieve biologic efficacy with the different things that we use to treat patients. For example, vitamin D3. There are blood tests for vitamin D3, the 25-hydroxy. If you're on ketoconazole, uh, by the way, another pioneering treatment that came out of Canada from John Trachtenberg. Okay, ketoconazole, an excellent therapy. Get a ketoconazole blood level. Make sure the drug is being absorbed and not being blocked by antacids or uh, other, by food or whatever. Check the ketoconazole blood level. Make sure it's at least three. Essential fatty acids are very important in terms of suppressing inflammation and, and suppressing prostate cancer growth. But we can objectify 
the uh, usefulness of how we administer the uh, essential fatty acids, like omega-3 fatty acids, by getting an essential fatty acid profile and looking at ratios of the W6, so omega-6 fatty acids, to omega-3. AA is arachidonic acid and omega-6 fatty acid. EPA is icosapentanoic acid, a very important omega-3 fatty acid. That optimal ratio should be about 1.5. I would, I would bet you that the vast majority of you here, if you had that test done, would be probably somewhere between 5 and 20. And just simply adjusting your consumption of omega-3 fatty acids would normalize that within a month. And now there's literature that shows that omega-3 fatty acids actually work together to improve efficacy of things like damage and deprivation therapy. This NMR lipoprofile profile is a really major advance in the evaluation of lipid values like LDL and HDL, but I don't see it used that, that often. It actually quantitates the number of particles of these different uh, lipids. And why is that important in prostate cancer? Because prostate cancer utilizes oxidized LDL to help its growth. And as you'll see tomorrow, oxidized LDL causes fatty change in the bone and lessens bone density. And when it does it, it releases bone-derived growth factors that help prostate cancer grow. So again, the integrative wheel in medicine is pretty astounding. And here we have a way to quantitate that with a biologic endpoint. <coughs> A lot of uh, what I've tried to do in terms of my publications have involved supportive care of the, of the patient, the oncology patient. This is very important that we understand the concept of therapeutic index. Maximize the positive, eliminate the negative. I had an audio track of Bing Crosby and the Andrews sisters singing that old song. You gotta, you know, accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, that's what it's all about. Well, they were into the therapeutic index, being in, in the Andrew systems. Uh, they understood the importance of that. And they, you know, we have to understand also with our pharmacology and our treatments that all of life is a two-edged sword, that no therapy is about its downside, but our role as patients and as physicians and as partners should be find ways to maximize the positive and minimize the negative. So we should be looking at drug interactions. This should be a routine thing, mandated, that any time you get a prescription, that that pharmacist has to go and put your drugs into a drug interaction software program to make sure that we don't induce a problem where we're accentuating the negative rather than the positive. In the US, 100,000 people die each, each year, a million per decade due to drug toxicity. I don't know what the figure is for Canada. That would be interesting to find out. So here are major healthcare implications, not just human life, but cost and time spent and hospitalization and what our focus should be. So part of the reason that we get these drug interactions is that we forget the patient is a unique biologic organism that metabolizes drugs quite differently. Here's an excellent resource that goes into the way drugs are metabolized. I think this should be required reading for physicians and pharmacists. And this should be all put into some type of software program. And there's also genetic testing to see if any of us out there are slow metabolizers of certain drugs. I'm a slow metabolizer, metabolizer of lidocaine, cane drugs, and anesthetics. Uh, I have, have to always assert myself if I have any dental work, because they always overdose me with lidocaine. One time, they gave me so much lidocaine that I could not feel my entire face, and I was numb down to the middle of my chest. And I thought that I was going to stop breathing, because the dentist wouldn't listen to the fact that I was a slow metabolizer of lidocaine. This whole concept of pharmacologic multitasking is really a cool concept, because it saves money, it reduces the number of pills you have to take, it helps everyone in terms of cost of health care. And of course, it improves the therapeutic index because it decreases the likelihood of a drug side effect. So some examples. For, if you're a prostate cancer patient and you have hypertension, don't be on a calcium channel blocker. Ask your doctor to put you on an angiotensin receptor blocker. 
because there's nice literature showing that that has anti-prostate cancer activity. And also, it's probably one of the better drugs to treat hypertension in terms of protecting the kidneys. And if you have urinary problems, lower urinary tract symptoms, or LUTs, be put on an alpha blocker that belongs to the quinazoline family, Cardura or Hytra, as opposed to Flomax, which is not in the quinazoline family, because the alpha blockers will help to induce prostate cancer death or cause apoptosis. So here you're doing pharmacologic multitasking, helping urinary flow, but you're also using a drug that will also kill prostate cancer. And now the end, we're coming to the end of the presentation and also end of life services, we have to get back again to the concept about the care of the patient. We have to understand when all reasonable measures have been exhausted. We have to be honest with the patient and the family, as painful as it may be. We also, on the other hand, shouldn't categorize a patient as terminal if the patient's untreated or has not been seen by a highly trained, field trained, experienced trained physician. And of course, always be aware of a, of a physician that tells a patient that he has three and a half or 17.5 years to live, because how can anyone know what's going to happen in the ensuing years? And I always be careful about a physician who too quickly tells a patient he has only six months to live. If you come across a physician like that, tell them that you cannot pay your bill in six months. And then I'll give you another three months. <laughs> Uh, this comes from the primer on prostate cancer, and it, it's actually a, a true story about a patient that I saw on the urology ward uh, late at night uh, with a family approached me, uh, a patient, Ms. Jumaji, a uh, Japanese family. Uh, Please see my father, our father in consultation. I wanted to go home, I was tired. I said, you've got to get the approval of the urologist, and unfortunately for me, they got the approval, and I saw the patient that night. By that time, the family had gone home. The patient only spoke Japanese. This was my 1985. I couldn't get any history from the patient. So in 1985, uh, we really did not have, at that time, uh, easy access to drugs like Lupron, Zolodex, Trollstar. We only had really surgical approaches like orchiectomy. So what did I do? I, embarrassingly, all I could do is I examined the patient and I checked to see if the man still had his testicles. And he did. So I told the family that the only thing that I could do, this man was on a morphine drip with uremia, kidney failure, with creatinine level of like six, who would have really was uh, in a setting where he would be dead within a matter of hours to a few days at the most. And the urologist came back that night and did an emergency orchiectomy, which is what I had suggested to the family. And the next day on rounds, the patient was being weaned off his morphine, and by the end of the week, uh, he basically was pain-free. And his renal function improved to the point where he was normalized. And uh, about a year later, his bone scan, which was markedly abnormal all over the place, had completely normalized. And by 1987, when the PSA first came out, his PSA was measured at 0.0. .0. And he lived to the age of 92 and died of a CBA stroke. And now with the emphasis on integrative medicine as part of prostate cancer, we would have realized, as you'll hear tomorrow, the link between prostate cancer and neurologic disease. We would have hopefully, I would have hopefully, because I'll take the responsibility, Realizing you can't live forever, 92 isn't too bad, but maybe we could have even prevented this stroke in this moment. So remember, MD stands for medical detective, not medical deity. <laughs> and that the studies that are out there, as well-meaning as they are, very, very rarely take into account the uniqueness of your biological system nor factors such as will to live, or skill or talent of your physician, or creativity of your physician. Oh, on the wrong side. Well, most of 
the buttons have become reversed. Do you want to advance it for me? Yeah. We're having technological challenges all throughout. Keep going. Okay. Up. Oh, go back. No. Go back one. Yep, you're, you're fine there. Remember the importance of what we tell patients. Uh, we have tremendous abilities as physicians to implant hope or to implant uh, and cause depression. So thought forms are very important in terms of what a physician tells a patient. And also it's important to emphasize that there are new treatments out there. One of the big issues is how do we get them to the patient? How do we get the patient to the new treatment? Very, something that I think we have technology uh, answers to. I mean, why isn't there a website where you can plug in some key data and find out what clinical trial would be applicable to you and that you would be eligible for, no matter where it is in the world? Why would that be so difficult to do? I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a web, you know, site creator, I don't have that skill. But why would that be so difficult to put in your age, your previous treatment, your current PSA, whatever, Gleason score, and find out that you're eligible for all these clinical trials and here's the contact phone number to call or the email to send to. Wouldn't that be smart? Mm -hmm. Well, I have trouble, I have, again, I have patients all over the world, and one of you um, here today, I've had to send to, to San Francisco for treatment that I think is going to be a major, I think it already is clear that it's a major breakthrough ever on our own. Hopefully it will be approved soon. But uh, very, very difficult to get patients, on, for me, as a, a guy out there in, in the private community, to get them onto clinical trials. So maybe Larry will, will share and comment on that. The patient and the family and the entire group, including physician, has to seek out and try to find uh, where there are uh, new treatments in clinical trials. Next slide. So really, uh, these end-of-life services and all throughout the entire course of the patient, it's really all about love. Uh, you have to focus on the matters of the heart and of spirit if the physical battle with cancer is, is lost. Next. And I, I think that we forget to advise the family and friends that they really need to express thoughts of love and not focus on the illness anymore. I know that's easy to do that, but I think you have to really just share, as painful as it may be, your feelings. Recount wonderful memories. And I really don't like eulogies. That, I like pre-mortem eulogies. We're going to have eulogies. Let's have them while we're around. So, we're going to have a get-together. Let's celebrate someone's life right now where we can have a lot of laughs and, and good food and good wine or whatever we're drinking. Uh, in your relationship with your loved ones, say the things that you really want to say because you'll regret not having said them once, once that person is gone. Next, please. And the most common regret that I've heard and I've had myself is I wish I would have recorded our conversations or taken videos. Don't forget that. And don't, don't deny that to your brothers, sisters, children. Make sure that that's part of your legacy. And for physicians, be compassionate. Don't allow the patient to suffer. We need to be more free with our use of analgesics when they're needed. We need to really figure out ways to optimize the comfort of the patient. We need really to offer tender loving care from birth to death. Next, please. And then, this is, I think, important for us as legacy. The uh, poem by McCray in Flanders Fields. I'll let you read that yourself, because it gets me choked up too much. And I think we're at the last slide. So out of these intense complexities, intense simplicities emerge. Churchill again. And the next slide. We are seeking the simplest possible scheme of thought that will bind together the observed facts. That's from Albert. So I, th I thank you for this very difficult, this is a difficult presentation. It's painful. It's got a lot of things that are painfully, make you painfully aware of what needs to be done. 
But I think that if you really, truly express your humanity, your human unity, you as a group, this group alone could change the face of prostate cancer. I've seen it done in the past. So I encourage you to work with each other and with your physicians and change the world. Thank you.